Marion Harvey grew up in a fishing village called Bowness on the edge of the Firth of Forth. Her parents seemed to have been concerned to bring her up in the right way. Her father was one of those in the village who had sworn to both the National Covenant and the Solemn Leaguing Covenant. She would have gone to church there and learned the catechism at school. But as Marion grew up, she didn't really care about these things. In fact, she started to rebel against them. She couldn't bear to hear a whole chapter of the Bible read. It was like a burden to her. She wanted to think about other things, not the things of God. She didn't like family worship and going to church. When she became a teenager, she only got worse. She had no thought about God or her soul. She didn't think anything of sinning openly. The name of God was just a swear word to her. It didn't mean anything more. And she hated the idea of being kept from doing what she wanted to do on the Lord's Day. She didn't care what people said about keeping the Sabbath holy. Perhaps it was curiosity. Perhaps she liked the idea of doing something that was against the law. Whatever the reason was, she decided to join the crowds going to the persecuted ministers preaching at meetings in the fields. What she heard made a great change in her heart and life. She heard of the gospel of free forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ alone. Her great need was to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, she found him. I sought him and found him, she could say. I held him and would not let him go. By now, she was 14 or 15. Now she loved and honoured the name of God, rather than blaspheming it. The Sabbath was a delight to her, when she could devote time to seeking God and honour him by keeping it holy. The Bible that she had no time for before was now a new book which she delighted to read. Marion travelled to where she could hear the field preachers such as Donald Cargill and Richard Cameron. She was greatly blessed in listening to these sermons and later recalled that her soul was refreshed by them. For about five years she loved nothing more than hearing this preaching of Christ and the Word of God. But simply going to hear such preachers was dangerous at this time. There were some people at the time who were greedy. They knew that they could make a lot of money from the government by spying and telling the authorities about the Covenanters. One of them was called James Henderson, who lived just outside the north of Edinburgh. He knew that Donald Cargill was in Edinburgh, and together with others, they thought up a wicked way of trying to trap and arrest him. They produced a fake letter that was supposed to be from some Covenanters in Fife. They were asking Donald Cargill to go and preach there. James Henderson delivered the note to Donald Cargill. I can go and get a boat ready for you to take you across the Firth of Forth, he suggested. But he had arranged for soldiers to wait on the road going out of Edinburgh. James Henderson was like Judas Iscariot. He didn't mind if he got rich by other people being put to death. Marion was in Edinburgh too at this time, and she'd heard of the meeting that Donald Cargill would preach at in Fife. So she decided that she would also go, along with a lady called Mrs Moore and some men. Donald Cargill was going to come behind them on horseback. They were walking along the road out of Edinburgh. Suddenly the soldiers rushed out and grabbed hold of them. Mrs Moore managed to escape and warned Donald Cargill, but Marion and the two men were captured. The sergeant questioned Marion roughly. Was she one of those who attended the field meetings, he asked. She said that she was, and so she was carried back to be put in prison in Edinburgh. At the age of twenty, it was going to be a very hard time for her. She had to go before the most important men in the government. The only charge against her was simply that she had gone to hear the gospel preached at the field meetings. They didn't have witnesses. They had just forced her to admit to this. The men of the government roughly demanded question after question. What did she think about this and that? 
They were trying to catch her out and get her to say something that they could use against her. They said all kinds of nasty things and even accused her of murder. One of them threatened that she would be tortured using a boot that would crush her leg. She had to be wise and calm in her answers. She reminded the men in front of her that they themselves had sworn to the National Covenant and Solemn League and Covenant, just like her father. They didn't like that. They demanded that she would submit to the king. She told them that the king had robbed Christ of his kingly rights. Then they said to her, You are about twenty years old. Are you going to throw your life away? Marion was very brave and said, I love my life as well as any of you do, but I will not redeem it upon sinful terms, for Christ says, He that seeks to save his life shall lose it. In the kindness of God, another young woman was in prison with Marion. Her name was Isabel Allison, and they were able to help each other. After the men who had been captured along with Marion had been put to death, the government decided that these two young women would be next. When they read out the sentence of being put to death, Marion said, I charge you before the tribunal of God, as you shall answer there, for you have nothing to say against me but for my owning the persecuted gospel. Marion had five days left, and so she wrote something to encourage her friends. Christian friends and acquaintances, I being to lay down my life on Wednesday next, I thought fit to let it be known to the world, wherefore I lay down my life, and to let it be seen that I die not as a fool or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. No, it is for adhering to the truths of Jesus Christ and avowing him to be king in Zion and head of his church. And the testimony against the ungodly laws of men and their robbing Christ of his rights and usurping his royal prerogative, which I could not but testify against. She wrote about how much of God's presence she had known in prison now he has said to me, Because he lives, I shall live also. And he has told me, I am he that blotteth out thine iniquity for mine own name's sake. I bless him that thoughts of death are not terrible to me. He has made me as willing to lay down my life for him as ever I was willing to live in the world. Now let not the frowns of men nor their flatteries put you from your duty. It is my grief that I have not been more faithful for my master Christ. All his dealings with me have been in love and in mercy. His corrections have been all in love and free grace, free love. I may say I am a brand plucked out of the fire. What did she mean by that? She was thinking about how sinful and rebellious she had been, and how much she deserved God's just punishment against sin. She hadn't cared about going to a lost eternity, but God had stopped her by his grace. She was like a burning stick rescued out of the fire, and the fire put out so that it could be used again. The Bible speaks of this, and those who are like a brand plucked from the burning. I am made to wonder and admire at his love, she said. And she concluded her letter with these words, now farewell, lovely and sweet scriptures, which were always my comfort in the midst of all my difficulties. Farewell faith, farewell hope. Then she also mentioned the preachers whose words had been such a spiritual blessing to her. Farewell wanderers, who have been of comfort to my soul in hearing them commend Christ's love. Farewell brethren, farewell sisters, farewell Christian acquaintances, Farewell sun, moon and stars, and now welcome my lovely Christ Jesus, into whose hands I commit my spirit throughout all eternity. On the day of her execution, as Marion left the prison, she said to some friends nearby, Behold, I hear my beloved saying unto me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. On the scaffold, Marion sung the 84th Psalm, 
and she read the third chapter of Malachi, which closes with these words. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Both Marion and Isabel Allison were going to give their lives for Christ that day. Though they were despised of others, Christ was saying, They shall be mine in the day when I make up my jewels. I am come here today, Marion told the crowd, for avowing Christ to be head of his church and king in Zion. Seek him, sirs, seek him, and ye shall find him. I sought him and found him. I held him and would not let him go. In her dying speech, she mainly spoke of God's love to her and commended free grace. Much of the Lord's presence, she said, have I enjoyed in prison, and now I bless the Lord, the snare is broken and we are escaped. When she came to the foot of the ladder, she prayed, and then when going up the ladder, she said, My fair one, my lovely one, come away. And sitting down upon it, she said, I was a blasphemer and Sabbath breaker, and a chapter of the Bible was a burden to me, but since I heard this persecuted gospel, I dared not blaspheme nor break the Sabbath, and the Bible became my delight. But she could say nothing more. The hangman was ordered to stop her speaking and put her to death. Sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that they or others are too sinful and rebellious to be converted, and that they have gone too far. But we can never despair of them being saved. God's grace is able to change the worst sinners. Though Marion had rejected the privileges she had received and sinned so much against God, he had mercy on her. But simply rejecting the gospel and not obeying it is a very serious thing too. It is dishonouring God every bit as much as blaspheming and breaking the Sabbath. Marion's life speaks to all of us. It says, Seek Christ, seek him, and you will find him. Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near.